Hey guys, in today's video we're going to take a look at the different types of roaming that can take place within our network, as well as taking a look at the purposes of Layer 2 and Layer 3 roaming. As well as this, we'll take a look at some examples of where these can be useful and beneficial within our network designs. This video forms part of the CCMP Enterprise Core Exam Series 350401. The exam topic covered as part of this video is 3.3D, which is to describe the main principles and use cases for Layer 2 and Layer 3 roaming. So let's get started. There are four types of roaming events that can occur within our wireless network, depending on the design of our wireless infrastructure. These roaming events are intra-controller roaming, inter-controller roaming layer 2, inter-controller roaming layer 3, and anchor mobility. We'll start off by taking a look at intra-controller roaming. This is the most simplest form of roaming that could occur. It occurs when a client roams from one AP to another, both of which are connected to the same wireless LAN controller. What will happen when the client roams to AP2, as shown in the example here, the client database within the wireless controller will be updated to show the new AP in which our client is connected to. This method of roaming allows for extremely fast roaming times as the controller doesn't have to communicate with any other controller before the client can roam. Next up we have inter-controller layer 2 roaming. This roaming occurs when our client roams between APs on two different wireless LAN controllers. However, each of these controllers still has an interface on the same subnet or VLAN. As you can see in the example here, both the wireless controllers will communicate with each other with what's known as mobility messages. These messages are sent via UDP port 16666. You can see in the example that when our client roams to the new AP, the client data is copied from the database on the original wireless controller to the new one the client is associated with. Again, this method of roaming allows for extremely fast roaming times as the controllers are on the same subnet and the client doesn't have to aggressively search for a new IP address. Another method of roaming is inter-controller roaming at layer 3. This occurs when our client roams to an AP registered to another wireless controller that is on a separate subnet or VLAN. As before, the controllers will communicate with each other via mobility messages, but this time, instead of copying the database entry change to the new controller, the updated database entry is copied over to the new controller. In addition to this, we now class the first wireless controller our client associated with as the anchor controller. The first controller our client associates to is always known as the anchor controller. The new controller the client has roamed to on the other hand is known as the foreign controller. The reason for this is that if you notice on the example, our client has kept the IP address it was assigned when it associated to the first controller. This occurs when we complete layer 3 inter-controller roaming to avoid the client from having to connect to DHCP to receive a new IP address on the new subnet, delaying the length of time it takes the client to roam. You might be wondering, however, how the client can use the IP address it obtained from the first controller on this new controller when they're both in different VLANs. It does this by creating a CatWAP tunnel back from the wireless controller the client has associated with to the original wireless controller. Finally, the last method of roaming we can use is known as auto anchor. This method of roaming is used when we want to anchor traffic from an SSID to a particular controller within our mobility domain. What this essentially means is take for example our guest SSID. We may decide for security reasons we don't want any of the traffic touching our network. Instead, what we might do is catwap this traffic back to a controller located in a DMZ network and pump this traffic straight out to the internet, as shown in the example here. Now that we understand the different types of roaming that can take place, let's take a look at some use cases for Layer 2 and Layer 3 roaming. First off, Layer 2 roaming. This can be beneficial if we require fast roaming, for example applications that are time sensitive like VoIP. In addition to this, a use case where we only have requirements that fit a single subnet with a small amount of clients connecting can suffice with Layer 2 roaming. Finally, Layer 3 roaming. This is beneficial if we have a large network for example a university spanning multiple campuses. It would be beneficial to have different VLANs within different campuses to avoid spanning VLANs across multiple locations. In addition to this, as we discussed previously, a good use case for using layer 3 roaming is the ability to tunnel all traffic from an SSID to a single wireless controller for security reasons. As used in the example before, this could be our guest network traffic tunneled back to a controller within our DMZ network. And there we have it, that's a complete overview of how Layer 2 and Layer 3 roaming works within our wireless networks. Hopefully that's provided you with a better understanding of how the different types of roaming work and some use cases for each. 
If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments. Apart from that, remember to subscribe and like the video for more CCMP Enterprise videos. I hope you've enjoyed and I'll catch you next time.